Hi everybody, I, I'm currently under attack from uh, one or two individuals who are attempting to gain access to my name, address, and phone number through claiming my videos are infringing on their copyright. They've posted three claims against three of my videos. LPS 2, The Rights of the Child, Fempocalypse, and LPS Part 1, Men Have an Equal Responsibility. Their claim is that I am infringing on their original works, Femdompocalypse, The Rights of a Child Part 2, and Men Have an Equal Responsibility, which they claim are their original works. Googling of these titles receives no relevant hits. As you can see in the screenshot, to file a counterclaim, I must make personal information, including legal name, address, and phone number available to the claimant. There is no unoriginal material in these videos. Anyone who has watched any of these three videos will know that I am sitting at my kitchen table reading from a script I've written. These are my original works, with no content from other copyrighted works in them. I own the copyright to these videos. The system is now automated. Removal is instant, and counterclaiming requires that I give YouTube permission to disclose my personal information to the individuals who have made a claim against me. This is a disgusting abuse of the system in order to dox me. I know this because there were only two claimants. They don't want to shut down my account. They want me to counterclaim to prevent a third strike and deletion so that they can get my personal information and begin a campaign of real-life harassment. This attack occurred only a day or two after the first highly upvoted, over a hundred upvotes, comment I left on the channel of Free From Thought blogger and popular atheist turned feminist Zom Gitz Chris. According to the people in the skeptic atheist community, there have been incidents of stalking and harassment of individuals in that community who do not toe the FTB feminist party line. Hi everyone, I'm Girl Writes What? And this is part two of a series I'm doing on legal paternal surrender, otherwise known as financial abortion, uh, in which I've been examining the various arguments people use to support the enforcement of the obligations of parenthood on men against their consent. Uh, one of the most stubborn ones, uh, arguments that I've come across thus far, is the rights of the child. Um, uh, first off, I'm going to take a moment to define terms. Uh, for the sake of argument, I'm going to be occasionally referring to the fetus as a child or person um, in this video, not because I believe a cluster of cells is a child or a person, um, but because when it comes to this argument, um, they're essentially the same. Uh, the fetus ends up being a child, which is a person with rights, um, and uh, because the law sometimes does indeed consider the fetus a person uh, in the sense that it can be the victim of a crime. Um, also, for the sake of this argument, I'm going to use the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's definition of rights. Um, that is, rights are entitlements to perform or to not perform uh, certain actions or to be or not to be in certain states. Um, or entitlements that others perform or not perform certain actions or be or not be in certain states. Um, I'm also going to take a moment to preface my ideas with the fact that we all have rights and that society is largely built on the balancing of the rights of individuals and that people's right to do one thing or not do another um, sometimes results in inconveniences and difficulties <laughs> for other people. Uh, that may be inconvenient or difficult, but are not necessarily infringements of their rights. While some may argue that rights are inherent and inalienable, uh, in practical terms, uh, what rights individuals have are determined by society. Uh, once it's determined that a specific person or category of persons have certain rights, uh, those rights can be violated by other individuals, um, but that doesn't take them away that doesn't abrogate those rights, it simply suspends them uh, in favor of, of uh, that violation. Um, and while there are times when individuals' rights come into conflict with uh, the rights of other individuals, um, and the only solution is to violate one person's rights in order to preserve the 
uh, more important rights of another person, this really doesn't take away the rights of the person who was violated. Um, those people still have rights. I'm also going to be talking a bit about the concept of best interests, uh, which absolutely differs from the concept of rights. Um, I could argue that it's in my best interest to have a reliable vehicle and a good job. This is certainly not a right. On the other hand, uh, respecting a person's rights can actually leave them objectively worse off than if you had violated them. Uh, such as respecting the rights of a Jehovah's Witness to refuse a blood transfusion uh, and then having them die uh, for lack of that transfusion. Um, in this case, violating that individual's rights would objectively be in their best interest. And I'm also going to state right up front that none of this legal paternal surrender stuff applies to men who consented to fatherhood and then just changed their minds. Uh, when you consent to become a parent, uh, you are willingly taking on obligations and you should be in it for the duration. Uh, that means that you have obligations to your children that you just can't or shouldn't be allowed to walk away from. Now, the argument of the child's rights, uh, it used to be, and still is among many traditionalists, that a child has a right to the financial support of its father. Um, but even feminists can't really repeat that one in polite company anymore. Um, nor can either traditionalists uh, or feminists claim that a child has the right to the financial support of both parents. It, it simply doesn't. Um, as a lot of single, uh, single wage earner families will attest to. Um, so this argument has really shifted to one where the claim is that the child has the right to the support of both biological parents. However, characterizing this as a right uh, is categorically and demonstrably false. Um, if it were true, it would be a crime for a single woman to use the services of a sperm bank in order to become a mother. It would be against the law for a woman to leave the name of the father off the birth certificate or uh, fail to take measures to inform him of her child's existence and seek support. It would be against the law for women to abandon their children uh, when in fact we have a huge legal framework in place that allows women to do just that with their newborn babies. And while some will say that this legal framework is in place to prevent infanticides, uh, and that the child's right to life supersedes uh, its right to the support of its biological parents, I find it kind of bizarre in the context of this particular debate uh, that we bend over backwards to make accommodations uh, under which the state will happily take on the full responsibility and burden of the care of a child, um, because otherwise a, a mother might commit a murder. Um, even as we force obligations on men who wanted those children just about as much as those women did, um, if men began smothering babies to the point where something needed to be done, would we be making accommodations to serve their needs? Uh, or would we simply be throwing them in prison? I also came across a feminist in one of these debates that claimed that because the system will charge a person with murder for intentionally causing a woman to miscarry, uh, that meant the rights of the fetus are asserted by the mother, um, which is just one of the most illogical things I think I've ever heard. Uh, the rights of the fetus are not asserted by the mother, um, they're determined by the mother. If the mother wishes to abort uh, the fetus, she's fully entitled to do so. Um, if the mother wishes, that is, the fetus has no rights at all. Um, and again, if the mother wishes, the fetus has a right to, to be born, a right to life, and a charge of murder can be levied. Uh, is anyone else seeing a pattern here? Uh, and it seems to be a pattern that spreads across this entire debate. Um, the rights of the child, before birth and after, are determined uh, by the whim of the woman who bears it. Uh, if she wishes, the fetus has a right to life. If she doesn't, uh, the fetus has no such right. Um, if she wishes, the child has the right to the support of only one parent. If she decides to use an anonymous sperm donor or leave the father's name off the birth certificate. Uh, if she wishes, the child has a right to the support of two parents and a claim of paternity and enforceable child support will be made. Um, if she wishes, the child has a right to the support of one or two adoptive parents, should she choose to adopt it out. Um, I'm not even going to get into de facto fatherhood and the child's right to the support of a man who isn't the child's biological parent, but just happened to live with the mother for, depending on where you live, six months to two years. Um, 
And, and if she wishes, uh, the child has the right to the support of no parents. If she abandons it at a safe haven uh, from where it will go into foster care, uh, without first finding a person or a couple willing to take on permanent care of that child. The child has whatever rights the mother wishes it to have. And frankly, if a person's rights are determined solely on the whim of another person's individual desires, they're not rights. Um, it's, it's society's consensus right now that whatever children are entitled to, that's to be decided and determined by mothers uh, rather than society. Um, so it's therefore society's consensus uh, that children do not have the right to the support of either biological parent. Uh, according to society, a child has uh, merely has the right to food, shelter, and care. And there's really uh, no determination on the part of society as to what person or persons have to pr provide that, that food, shelter, and care. Moving on to the best interests of the child uh, as a justification for holding non-consenting men financially accountable for children they didn't want. Again, it's in the best interests of all children to be raised in the best possible circumstances. Um, but really, how workable is that? How does one even measure best interests and, and how, like on a large scale? And how do we penalize those who fail to live, live up to the standard of best? Do we remove children from homes where parents prioritize date night over a kid's desire to play hockey, even if playing hockey is in that kid's best interest? Do we remove children from homes where parents let them play unsupervised at the park, even if supervision is in the child's best interest? Clearly, society finds it permissible to allow parents, even those who willingly consented to the obligations of parenthood, to prioritize their own interests over their children's interests so long as that child is not being seriously or immediately harmed or endangered. And frankly, no matter how well a child is doing, it could arguably do better. Children almost invariably do better when born and raised into two-parent homes, where both parents are involved in the child's life. Um, but is society prepared to enforce those best interests? Um, are there shotgun weddings being held all over the place? Uh, encouraged by the state? Um, here again, we see how the best interests of the child can be set aside by um, one or both parents uh, based on their personal desires, their best interests. And the craziest irony in all of this is that in 26 different markers of well-being and success, including the development of empathy, children raised by one parent do better if that parent is their father. Um, if the best interests of children were paramount, um, then we'd be overwhelmingly giving custody of kids to their dads in divorce cases. Uh, we'd have laws uh, locking people into marriage uh, and not letting them out unless they had good reason. Um, and, and we'd have a legal process for handing safe haven kids back to their biological fathers, which is something that only four out of 50 states actually have. And when discussing unplanned pregnancies, whether those pregnancies were unplanned by one party or by both parties, in practical application, the rights of the child and the best interests of the child are both essentially determined by the mother. Um, the child's rights are therefore not rights, and the child's interests are not the child's. They are the mother's. Outside of marriage, from the moment of conception until well after birth, children are, in the strictest legal sense, the property of their mother, to do with as she sees fit. And if they're the property of the mother, then they should really be her property. Um, it should be her job to take care of that child. And if she can't do that on her own, frankly, if the state is willing to take on the entire burden of the care of a child, um, at the mother's behest, through a safe haven a, uh, abandonment, then the state should absolutely be prepared to do the same for men, take on part of the burden of a child, um, if the biological father doesn't agree, uh, never agree, to become a father. There are three sets of rights involved in any unplanned pregnancy, uh, the rights of the mother, the rights of the child or fetus, and the rights of the father. Right now, the woman has 100% of post-conception rights over both herself and the child. 
Um, the child has no rights at all beyond that which the mother sees fit to give it, and uh, the state uh, bestowed right of food, shelter, and care. And the man has no rights at all, and, uh, and whatever obligation the woman chooses to extract from him. Uh, the woman has the right to unilaterally decide what kind of life she will have, uh, whether she'll become a mother or won't, uh, what kind of life her child w will have, uh, with one parent, two parents, no parents, biological parents, foster parents, and, and, and she has the right to determine what kind of life the biological father will have. Uh, will he be a sperm donor completely unaware of the existence of his progeny? Or will his life be one of financial servitude, based on her choice? He is forced to live by her leave. And while the only people who should have any say over women's right to abort or give birth uh, should be the women who are uh, involved, uh, because it is their body, um, men deserve an equal right to personal autonomy, uh, to freedom, and to choice. Uh, to consent to the burdens and responsibilities of parenthood or not. And and it it really sounds heartless. I, I understand that it sounds heartless. It sounds like I'm just casting babies to the wolves. But I think what gets lost in this entire debate is that men are people too. And that means that they have rights. And they have a right to personal autonomy. They have a right to, uh, to not be obligated to other people when they have no say, no say at all. And, uh, and, and I just, I, yes, it's a helpless baby, and yes, he's a man, um, but the balancing of these rights, um, where it seems that the rights of the child and the best interest, interests of the child only seem to matter if they coincide with the mother's. And, uh, and then, holy shit, look out. Uh, this equation is so unbalanced, um, I, just, I just can't even begin to describe how lopsided it is. And honestly, obligation without rights, freedoms, or choices, that's slavery. It is. And, and it, it's amazing how, how willing we are, how complicit we are as a society in not only enforcing that slavery on an entire class of people if they step wrong, but suspending their rights, violating their rights yet again by placing them in prisons that have been deemed illegal. Uh, debtors' prisons are illegal. It is against the law for the government to say, you owe somebody money, you're going to jail until you pay it. But this is what we do. How is it that we are prepared to violate the rights of men to personal autonomy, to violate the rights of men to uh, freedom, choice, uh, all of this, and enforce obligations on them that are the equivalent of, uh, of slavery, and then put them in an illegal prison when they don't live up to that? It's, it's just not fair. It's not treating men as human beings. And, uh, and that, that's really all I have to say about that. So uh, I guess I uh, hopefully will see you all again when I tackle the next fallacious argument, um, which uh, I'm not sure which one I'm going to do next, but it'll be not too long from now. So until then, I'm Girl Writes What. Ciao.